we are ready to start. So um, welcome to the first online event of our Tech and Society Communication Group. Our goal is to create a platform for the discussions around the questions of how technological progress influences development of the society. And our first meeting will be devoted to the very important questions of existential risks, especially from the advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence. And I'm excited to introduce to you our special guest, Jan Tallinn. Hi, Jan. Hello, thanks for having me. Jan is very incredible personality to talk with about the technological progress and its influence on the society because um, he influences the process both as technologist and as investor and philanthropist. Uh, just a couple of words about Jan. He was the founding engineer of Skype and Kazar, and currently he cares about uh, the subject of existential risks. So he co-founded Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risks, the Future of Life Institute, and philanthropically supports other existential risk research organizations. And Jan is also active angel investor, served on several high-level uh, groups and commissions. And uh, Jan, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, so I would love to start uh, with a very uh, let's say important question. So what do you consider as the most dangerous existential risks for the humanity? Well, I mean, by definition, I call, consider all existential risk dangerous, uh, uh, and they are kind of equally dangerous in the sense that, like, once once uh, any existential risk realizes, we're no longer here. So it's going to be like a very uh, bleak future for the universe. Um, but in terms of like probabilities, um, yeah, I think it's uh, we can kind of uh, divide existential risks into. Two classes. Uh, one is natural existential risks, risks from things like asteroids or super volcanoes, uh, things that we have been kind of exposed to uh, for like hundred or two hundred thousand years, depending on how we count. And then we have uh, risks from new technology, uh, and they are, in the sense, I think more important because th those are novel. Like we have not, uh, I mean, we have been exposed to kind of existential risks uh, of uh, nuclear uh, Armageddon for the last hundred years or so. Uh, that didn't uh, exist before. Uh, and uh, indeed, kind of, uh, we probably will have more risks like nuclear uh, in our future, uh, just because we are sort of sailing into uncharted territory when it comes to technological environments. So with that in mind, my own sort of ranking and people will have different rankings. My own ranking is that the yeah, artificial intelligence is uh, the most, sort of the biggest source of existential risk uh, this century and uh, is kind of followed by synthetic biology uh, as, uh, as on, the, on the second place. This is, uh, I think, appeals to everyone. And uh, we actually ran uh, a poll this among participants of our group. We are a very diverse group, so we try to understand what society might think about the different um, aspects of existential risks. And I'm glad to share the results of uh, this poll, which actually no one's seen. And I think our first question was exactly this one. So how would you rank? Um, um, how would you rank uh, the risks as uh, the one that is the most uh, dangerous? So I think as, as you hope you can see from the screen, so our audience thinks that actually climate change, the 31% of our audience think that climate change is the uh, um, biggest risks for the existence of uh, mankind. Then we have nuclear war, about the same as development of artificial intelligence. Then we have people who are not scared of anything and think that all these risks are nonsense. And this is followed by natural disasters. So mm -hmm. I hope we can run uh, the poll again after our event because it will show how people will perceive the subject. But so far, I think what you name it as uh, natural disaster essential risks and uh, the development of artificial intelligence is what society still considers to be maybe less dangerous as a uh, climate change, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like one very good source of uh, 
such comparative analysis is uh, uh, Toby Ord, uh, philosopher at Oxford, uh, his book called Precipice, uh, where he kind of like systematically ranks different national, natural and uh, and human made uh, risks, including climate change, including uh, uh, asteroids, super volcanoes, AI, and you name it, uh, to, to kind of like have like a principled side by side comparison uh, of uh, yeah, probabilities and impacts. Yes, it's totally unscientific, you know, like it's more like the opinions of people. And I know from my own perceptions that uh, after communicating with you, I totally changed my view on all those risks. I'm looking forward to the, um, to the conclusions we will have after the second poll at the end of our event. So I'm just... Uh, I would actually add like one interesting bit that I've been uh, you know, telling to uh, people, like uh, nuclear weapons definitely post like a very significant existential risk for 10 years uh, which went from the uh, invention of nuclear chain reaction by Leo Zillard uh, in 33 I want to say and the first nuclear test in uh, 44 I think it was uh, so like there was like a period about 11, 10, 11 years during which it wasn't sure whether the uh, earth could withstand a nuclear detonation or not. Mm -hmm. And like the uh, people in Berkeley uh, of the Manhattan Project, they actually did a calculation uh, and that pr they produced a report called Report LA602. You can look it up. That's the first scientific uh, existential risk analysis uh, that humanity has produced. They calculated what is the probability of the atmosphere uh, being burned up by, by the first nuclear detonation, basically the nuclear bomb serving as a catalyst for the atmospheric nitrogen to start the fusion process and turn the entire planet into a giant uh, fusion bomb. Uh, and they, they, they found that, okay, we have about 3x margin. <laughs> and importantly, the next calculation they got free. They went like three x wrong. The, the the first thermonuclear test, they were off about three x. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the first the thermonuclear test in the U.S. basically was wasted because the, the equipment measuring equipment was destroyed because of the calculation error by the same group of people, who I mean to the credit did the did analysis, but I I'm not sure if they if they actually made the correct decision as a result of that calculation to go ahead with the test. Well, if to consider that now we have a lot of research about artificial intelligence and its development, it's a fascinating story to, to Yeah. Um, so something about our other results. Um, so we have, um, sorry, we have uh, second poll when we asked people um, what they consider as the most probable risk. So could it be artificial intelligence development that will uh, makes the existence of humanity not possible, or it will be the risk of a huge asteroid falling to Earth. And people are convinced that artificial intelligence is actually something to look at and at least to try to control, which I think it's uh, a very good result. Let's do that. Our third question is actually um, uh, if people think this development of artificial intelligence existential risk or not and as you see our audience is quite prepared uh, to all the dangers of it and uh, like 24 people 24% uh, of people are not convinced on this so again I hope uh, we can measure mm -hmm. this after our event and to see how, how it goes um, so my next question would be about probability because um, as we ask it what could happen what not so what would you think as a probability and probably the timeline for developing such a system that uh, can be really threatening to humanity? I mean, one kind of uh, important thing um, to keep in mind kind of when, when assessing uh, probabilities of this is uh, kind of epistemic humility uh, looks Kind of very different from what people uh, intuitively thinks, think. Uh, like in the book, um, Making of the Atomic Bomb, I can't quickly recall the author. Uh, like uh, there, there's like a one uh, person in Manhattan Project, 
well, also for, forget. I think it might have been uh, Niels Bohr, who basically made the same point is that as academicians, uh, he said, we're kind of used to thinking that conservative point of view is to assume that this thing, and he was talking about nuclear weapons or chain reaction, will not work. So like uh, that's why Fermi said that it's almost like it's it's just impossible uh, that that this thing this thing will work. Or 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 Ernst Rutherford even more famously said that nuclear chain reaction harvesting energy from nuclear chain reaction is a moon, moonshine. So that was kind of like the proper human humili- uh, uh, the proper hu- showing proper humility, thinking that like the probability is zero, uh, because like then if it turns out uh, that it wasn't zero, then you, you have been like kind of uh, on on erring on the right side. But actually that's wrong. That's completely wrong when we're talking about risks. So so it's like, I think it's just irresponsible to say that the risk is zero. In fact, like the, I think the uh, nuclear power industry, as Ukraine is like famously uh, familiar with, kind of uh, fell into this trap. Like the, the nuclear power industry basically you know, destroyed itself by saying that the risk is zero. Uh, and, and like once it turned out that the risk was not zero, uh, it was basically like, bye. <laughs> like, we, like th- th- there's no future for, for for nuclear anymore. Unfortunately, because like the, there's like a lot of uh, potential when it comes to addressing a lot of problems uh, that humanity has in nuclear. Uh, so uh, like, so in that sense, we, with that all that <laughs> long uh, preface uh, in mind, I think it's like kind of irresponsible to say that uh, that with there's like a zero risk uh, from anything. Just as it, it's kind of like overconfident to say that, like we are almost certainly doomed. So, like, o- like just on this like very strategic prior calculations, your risk should be somewhere between ten and ten and ninety percent to start off with. So and then you start updating it uh, with evidence. Uh, and so, like uh, with that in mind, my kind of current um, position is that uh, it seems that we are about. I want to say 20 to 30 years uh, away from like very plausible uh, inflection point in sense that uh, like then it becomes more probable than not that we would have human level uh, intelligence. But doesn't, that doesn't mean that I would give like zero probability to like this year or, or the next five years. I think that's like definitely non-trivial probability that we will we will have something disruptive in the next uh, next few years. And that that's just like the sort of assessment of uh, what what I would give to uh, having machines on this planet that in very relevant important domains are more competent than humans that doesn't mean like that that's equals the probability to do like uh, so it's like it's still possible that we're going to have like very competent machines that humans perhaps even couldn't control properly but we still continue to exist alongside with us, alongside with them uh, in fact like a lot of the effort that I'm uh, uh, kind of trying to cultivate in the world, cultivate in the world is to make sure that this would be the case. Like, if even if we will get uh, kind of super intelligent machines, uh, it means that they wouldn't kind of automatically destroy the planet. Because, like, in, like, there's like a very one way of putting it is that in some ways, superhuman AI is like an alien visiting our, our planet. Like, the, as I made uh, this point to Olena earlier, uh, that if you play against uh, Alpha Zero. You're playing against an opponent that never interacted with human civilization. You're playing uh, a chess game or or go game or shogi game with a kind of universal agent uh, that uh, that never learned anything from human civilization. You're really playing like a literal alien, playing against a literal alien. So in that sense, in a very similar sense, AI would be an alien. But there's a very important difference. So like the very important similarity is that imagine how like humanity would and should react if we get the uh, uh, message that in the next 20 or 30 years there's a ship going to, going to arrive with aliens. I think we would like be, I hope we would be in a much better uh, position uh, to prepare ourselves than we are with AI, even though like, AI in some sense would be more alien than aliens. They, they, they wouldn't have like a superhuman, superhuman AI unlikely will have any similar uh, evolutionary history, whereas like biological aliens would likely have some shared features feature with humans. However, there's one Im- very important point why AI is in- meaningfully different from aliens. And it's like, we get to create them. Uh, so I think it's we should like really, we as human civilization should really invest in making sure that we 
get the best out of this degree of freedom and uh, try to be thoughtful about how and what kind of AIs we will create. Long answer, oh. sorry. Thank you, so, no, it, it's very interesting. So please explain this all to us. I mean, I so appreciate that you're taking time from uh, from your work to, to, to do all this. So 2030 is it's actually like tomorrow. So it, it's very, it, it's not, you know, like the, the years we can't imagine. So I think everyone who is now within this group will probably survive yeah. at the moment. That, yeah, that's like, yeah, like, so uh, like, uh, so the comment that I made about 10 years ago uh, to my co-founder at the Cambridge Center, Hugh Price, uh, Cambridge uh, Study of, Center for the Study of Existential Risk, uh, that kind of caught his attention was that like, I personally believe that extinction as a result, or like sort of AI as an existential risk features in the top three reasons of, of my own personal uh, kind of uh, causes of death along with like cancer and and uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, so like and, and for younger people that's that's even even more the case uh, so like because like even though the kind of normal reasons are like pretty common they don't kill everyone at once uh, which means that the probability for every individual person will be uh, kind of necessarily Okay, that, that's gonna. I'm not sure if, I, if I'm making sense right now. But anyway, like that, that I think it's it's very probable. Uh, so I I was really fascinated by the idea that actually this is not something very abstract. It's not something that mm -hmm. is so far away that people can't imagine. It is something that everyone should imagine as a part of the life uh, in a very short uh, lifetime period. Yeah. So like one way of kind of illustrating it is that we got the news that the world has cancer. <laughs> We don't know if you're gonna kind of die out of it, but like uh, it's, uh, we shouldn't kind of panic out of it. Uh, just like uh, if if you get get this news that there's like a ten or twenty percent probability that you're gonna die uh, in the next like decade or so, like uh, from from this diagnosis, like uh, you should kind of deal with it. And like uh, it's, uh, I think it's a very similar situation on civilization level right now. Okay, so from, from one side, it's encouraging that we can think about it. As, as you said, it's not the ship of aliens coming to us because I don't know what we would do if we would know about the ship of aliens, really. But on the other hand, it's really disturbing. I, I, I certainly hope that we wouldn't just like kind of compete about uh, like who's going to receive the alien ship first, as like uh, some companies are really encouraging right, right now to do. Another, another example I have is like imagine that, that we get like a uh, uh, news that there's like an asteroid made out of platinum <laughs> that is approaching the planet at uh, like a significant fraction of the speed of light, and 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 kind of the company leaders everywhere going like, we want to, want the asteroid land at our at our company. <laughs> it's like like no guys, it's not the platinum isn't the point. The kinetic energy is the point here. <laughs> Well, yeah, this is also disturbing. This is the part of our world, actually. I, I don't think our world is ready to this kind of uh, problems that actually should unite yeah. the world to solve them. Yeah, I think it's like really important to kind of uh, keep kind of stressing that that look, this is this is a civilization problem, just like the COVID is like a kind of a, 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 like I say, COVID is like a minimum viable global catastrophe. <laughs> like so, it's, it's great in the sense uh, that uh, now. We have like a living memory, what it means to have a global catastrophe. So I hope that we're gonna kind of going to get some leverage out of it, out of it when it comes to you know, dealing with uh, further problems like that, including uh, yeah, yeah, okay. other civilization problems. Good, good topical point. I also very much like uh, the framing of the Future of Life Institute uh, that you founded. So you have uh, really this um, great idea is actually Max Stegmart wrote in this book, Life 3.0, that we distributed participants of our group. So Max writes that our aim was simple to make sure that life has a future and this future should be as bright as possible. So I think this is um, yeah, very, very noble aim in general. Um, but I have a bit of, so just like to show the book to anyone, this is the Ukrainian edition of Life. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, which we are lucky to have, not all countries have translations So this. So I think when I was reading the book, which is very interesting, I recommend to everyone, 
I was struggling also to see the different terminology because I assume this is something that is very distributed, especially in technology community. And uh, something that resonates with me is the term for intelligence, which is, of course, the core if you speak about artificial intelligence and all these processes. So uh, Marx defines intelligence as an ability to achieve uh, difficult goals. And as far as understood, it could be applied both for humans, for general artificial intelligence, so for, for anything that uh, can potentially have intelligence, uh, um, what would we discuss? My question would be, for example, um, don't you think that this is uh, such a frame of intelligence that uh, by default creates the risk and problems because it doesn't specify the um, the, the goals, it doesn't specify the vector of the goals, so the directions. It doesn't say that uh, this should be achieved right to positive uh, goals. So maybe if you constrain something that just has this potential to achieve goals without by default this constraint for, for, for positiveness, um, I would say maybe this, is, this creates the problem with artificial intelligence by default. Yeah, I think like epistemically, you want to kind of uh, limit your uh, word games, <laughs> I want to say like that. Uh, so it's like uh, uh, the purpose of words is to kind of like cut the world, world at the seams. Uh, so uh, like, uh, like as you point out that uh, like there is like this important consideration called what your goals are. Uh, as long as you, they are kind of like distinct uh, from your ability to uh, kind of work towards those goals, optimize for those goals, uh, and indeed, like Nick Bostrom in, uh, in Oxford has this famous uh, paper called Orthogonality Thesis, where he claims that like it's for almost all goals uh, you can kind of uh, uh, separate the goal and uh, the ability to work towards them, the optimization power or the intelligence. Uh, so like, as long as you're gonna kind of agree that there is a, they are like separate concepts, it's kind of useful to keep them separate as concepts, uh, and not try to kind of like uh, put them together even, even if there's like some kind of, uh, some potential for them to work better as a joint, uh, joint concept. Uh, so, so yeah, in that sense, I, I'm, I'm like I think it, it's fine uh, to to have like intelligence as a as a separate concept. However, I do think that there's I agree that there's like a lot of confusion <laughs> that that kind of surrounds the uh, intelligence concept. So in that sense, like if whenever you are like, so that one way to approach it is like uh, look, there is something that different, differentiates uh, gorillas and and Homo sapiens. And uh, you can kind of like call it in different different ways, but it's it's it, there is something really meaningful, and it's not about the muscle mass. It's not about the, like the length of the of the teeth. There is there is something that deserves this concept, and why not call it intelligence? Uh, like that's that's the reason why why we are just landed on Mars, not 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 gorillas. Uh, and uh, so that's like one way of approaching, sort of like holistic way. Another way is, is to go like more scientific. Uh, there is this um, great sequence on the on the uh, alignmentforum.org. If you go, it's called Embedded, in, embedded Agency uh, and discussion about what it means to have like systems that optimize uh, for something. Uh, so you can also, also go like kind of more, more rigorous in a definition, more, uh, more mathematical in a definition, definitions. Uh, my own sort of third way, if, if you, if you wanna, wanna put it, is that I've been increasingly sort of unpacking the term of artificial intelligence uh, and hence also the intelligence term as delegation. So it's like, art, like whenever you see the, the term artificial intelligence, you can mentally replace it with, a, with the term of delegating human decisions to increasingly competent machines. Uh, and if you do that, do that rep, like kind of uh, search and replace in every text, like all the problems and opportunities become much clearer immediately uh, because you will see that, that like, let's say that's like a, Typical kind of uh, uh, arms race text that like we need to uh, kind of accelerate the uptake of AI, uh, which is like a very common phrase in, in certain circles. 
like if you're saying we need to ac accelerate the, the uh, speed at which we delegate human decisions to increasing competent machines, it's like a more right and b it also like uh, creates like a more visceral reaction to like wait a minute why <laughs> like is that a good idea yeah I understand why you want to do that but is that a good idea in general so that's uh, I think that's very useful uh, trick to do so yeah delegation is 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 one one way and and uh, and, and intelligence has uh, ability to make good decisions uh, against certain uh, goals that are, in principle, you know, can be as silly as, 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 as possible. I agree that delegation actually surfaces this kind of like problem on decisions, you know, like because uh, what, what I exactly tried to outline with this term that the problem is that we don't know the goals. And if you talk about decisions, it's more clear for people maybe that... Uh, yeah consequences uh, for them. You mentioned this um, IE alignment movement. Can you maybe just describe for the general public uh, mm -hmm. what, what is this about? Yeah, you can. Uh, everybody can go to alignmentforum.org uh, and have a look. That's like a sort of a public discussion uh, among uh, uh, AI alignment uh, researchers, uh, mostly a group of uh, academicians, uh, but also like uh, people with no academic background, uh, as well as uh, kind of uh, people at places like DeepMind, OpenAI, uh, and other kind of AI, AI groups who kind of uh, have, I don't know what's the English term, um, taken the bull by the horns, I guess. <laughs> it's like, okay, we have a problem. That's an interesting problem, which is, which is already like a, like we got humanity got lucky that that was the most important problem that we have also turns out to be so interesting uh and uh then they said okay we need to figure out what it, what it means to have what it means to be an agent uh what it means to be a, a non-human agent like what it means to have like a control over something what it means to uh be create a robust agent that can create that can create sub agents uh what it means to align uh the, the agents in the sense that like i have goals I create another agent, what it means to have them as a sort of like a companion rather than something that I have to kind of at some point work against. Uh, and I think that it's just like a lot of interesting writing and, and discussion and, and science uh, that's happening in that community. And also that is kind of like my main target of my main uh, philanthropy. Uh, like we just a couple of days ago, we announced another round uh, of, uh, of funding Myself and another donor were doing nine million dollars uh, for the first half of this year uh, in in funding uh, for people uh, groups who are exactly uh, working on uh, uh, on trying to, to kind of do the homework uh, for AI AI researchers. But that's not so. Sort of like that's not. Uh, uh, we also have like uh, other applicants in in uh, of larger. I want to say. EA community, effective altruism uh, community, who are working on, on various topics like uh, uh, life extension, for example, we have uh, given grants to. Then uh, uh, alternative foods. Uh, that's also an interesting interesting topic because, like, a lot one of the sort of areas of concern that. Uh, People EA community have is uh, animal welfare. Uh, if, if you're gonna think about like what what are the things, what does it mean to do good <laughs> in the world? Then, like at the end of the day, a lot of it sort of cashes out uh, as uh, increasing the you know, good observer moments uh, and decreasing bad observer moments, uh, which another way of putting it is like reducing suffering uh, of uh, conscious beings. Another question is like, who are conscious uh, besides humans? I think it's like less and less likely uh, over, over years that uh, consciousness is kind of uh, restricted to humans. So it's like we should like, and the humanity kind of increasingly so has started treating uh, kind of non-human non animals as, as, as conscious and therefore like, uh, Showing greater concern uh, about their welfare, and and yeah, so it's like synthetic uh, synthetic food or synthetic meats is another like interesting topic because of this perhaps like a 
a roundabout way uh, of uh, reducing uh, suffering. So it's interesting. So, for example, if I feed pigeons, I practically contribute uh, to, um, to I don't know, like bringing the welfare of animals uh, and intimate. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's like assuming uh, the life of a pigeon is uh, is worth living, which it probably is. But like, I don't think you have thought about it. Right? <laughs> I can like speak for hours about it. So there's like, like, I mean, there's like very interesting uh, topic that uh, the, some parts of the effective altruism movement are like really thinking about hard. Is like, uh, what if anything we should do about the suffering in the wild? Uh, that like, uh, like evolution is evolution is just like, a, as a friend of mine said, that evolution is a horrible thing. It should be stopped. It's like. Like as we speak, like a lot of uh, conscious beings are being eaten alive. Uh, so it's like, uh, like, is that a, an acceptable cost, or is it something that we can and should morally do something about? Uh, and of course, like we should, we should all have all the, all the disclaimers that we shouldn't come mess with things just because we think we are smart. Uh, so, so we, but but it's, I think it's kind of, it's moral imperative for us to have like a better idea uh, how to help. Uh, all conscious beings uh, while minimizing the side effects from that helping. Yeah, this is, sounds as an interesting part. We can all take part at, at least at the level of what we can do. I want to share now one um, picture from the book Life 3.0, which I probably just ask you maybe to tell us something. So I really like this, uh, what uh, Max called uh, like landscape of the human competence. I don't know if it's like common words uh, or not, uh, but it practically describes what uh, humans can do and what uh, uh, computers can do. And um, in 2017, like the, the water line is much higher now. This was my question. So is it something we should consider now or do you see any changes? Uh, do you agree with this uh, picture at all? So just to give a sense for everyone. So everything on the mountains and something that computers are better at uh, everything on this on the sea. No, sorry, this is everything on the mountains. It's something that humans are better at. Everything on the sea uh, is something that computers are doing better. If, if I'm right uh, in a so do you agree with this concept in general and what are the changes in this environment? I mean, it's a simplification for sure, right? But uh, uh, so like, uh, like uh, they're improving there is pretty high, although we just a couple of months ago we had news that GPT-3 was uh, contributing new theorems, new mathematical theorems, or like simplifications, versions of, of uh, theorems. Uh, so like uh, some parts of, parts of this uh, peak, I think, are underwater now. Uh, Vinograd test uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, uh, it's basically, uh, they are like tricky sentences that humans have no trouble understanding, but they have been like traditionally super difficult for, for humans, for uh, AIs, to un AIs to make sense of. They are, they are, sen they are, uh, they are uh, sentences like, the ball uh, did not fit in the suitcase because it was too small. What was too small, the ball or the suitcase? <laughs> Humans have no trouble understanding, uh, uh, giving the answer. Uh, but like traditional AIs have been 50-50. They just like ca can't tell like which one, which one, because it kind of requires you to, to visually model what's going on. You have to like interpret the words into a world model and then like run that world and see like, ah, okay, the situation is consistent with, with a mental picture where, where the ball is too big and, and the suitcase is too small. Hence the answer is too small, it's, it's a suitcase, not the ball. Uh, so, uh, but like turns out that vinograd schemas are almost solved now. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's like surprising, but, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's getting there. Of course, like people, I guess like proponents of vinograd schemas, like my good friend, Good friend and skeptic. Uh, come on, I can't. Hmm. 
I'm really blanking out on his name. That's really unfortunate. Oh, no, you don't know the people anyway, so so don't worry about it. Yeah, but well, it's a very famous name, uh, and I think he's been got. Kari Marcus, uh, yeah, is a professor at uh, NYU and a startup entrepreneur. Uh, so yeah, Kari Marcus has been like very adamant about like uh, AI being, although like he completely acknowledges the long-term uh, concerns about AI, but I think we thinks we he thinks we are very far away because like like in principle the current AIs we have are just like glorified lookup tables. Uh, they don't really understand what's what's going on in the uh, 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 what's important about their input. Uh, but like I think he's kind of increasingly the evidence shows. I think the new evidence that we're getting is basically against him, not not for his uh, for his hypothesis. Although he still might be wrong, might be right in the uh, in the end. There might be something that we're missing. The, the AIs might be solving uh, the Vinograd tests uh, for some value of solve, uh, but there still it doesn't kind of like uh, help them to to make sense of the world. I don't know. And uh, regarding, for example, this rankings of um, of of, uh, of how difficult it is for, for artificial intelligence um, to, to do something. So, so I assume art mm -hmm. cinematography is still something. Uh, <sighs> yeah, I I would actually disagree. I would kind of like uh, uh, I would break down the art mountain into like uh, sort of small like. Bad art and good art. Yeah, the, depending depending on no uh, no, I think like genre is really important. I think, for example, like painting is like way easier for AI uh, than uh, than novels. Uh, the even though like GPT three is like uh, showing like very interesting uh, capabilities. Like for example, I was like basically AI no longer makes grammar mistakes, uh, which is like a surprising uh, statement about twenty twenty. I don't know, 2019, when I think it came out in 2020. Uh, so, uh, so like I think AI has definitely like progressed a lot. Uh, the NLP has progressed a lot when it, when it, but I, but still I think it's like the one principle about assessing kind of AI capabilities is that you need to assess like what is the cost of mistakes. Uh, so and if you are doing a painting, like uh, having like a being like slightly off color or like having like one one bit of the painting uh, like kind of flipped in color is unlikely to kind of destroy the entire value of this. Whereas in in, uh, in novel, it's like much more likely if you get like one sentence wrong, you might be destroying the entire value of the novel. Uh, and similarly in like self trying, for example, like it's it's not a, like kind of sounds good on paper, like to have like AI that's uh, 99 competent, 99 percent competent in 90, make the right decisions in 99 percent of the time, but it's basically worthless <laughs> because like uh, the cost of mistakes is so high. Uh, so I do think that if one kind of lens at predicting where AI will get, like which parts of the landscape the AI will get, will uh, kind of flood the next, is uh, look at like what is the cost of mistakes in those domains, and hence like yeah, art in terms of painting like. Yeah, illustrative art is, I think, is kind of uh, less defended against AI than, than uh, yeah, written art. And uh, we have here a science as the very top of uh, anything that, uh, that yeah. computers can do. Uh, why is that? Is it, uh, is it naturally because uh, science like mm. combines everything all together, or? Yeah, I'm not sure. I do think it's sort of critical point, but I'm not actually sure if it's the highest. So, like the thing is, like, like once you have, once you take the science, once the AI floods the science thing, it immediately can self improve, uh, or like perhaps like AI design, which is like kind of next to it, can self improve and they accelerate the flooding. So, in that sense, like even if the science and AI design peak is not the highest sort of in some abstract sense in practice it is all that matters so if it takes if it if it plus that thing like it doesn't matter how high the other other bits are uh, because they will be flooded immediately after makes sense so yeah i wanted to check it with you because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. i found it quite interesting okay so um 
just speaking about, we also had the programming actually uh, somewhere uh, in between uh, the science and uh, the general, I would say, um, activities. And uh, uh, I just wanted to ask you, so for example, um, the work of the programmers and uh, the ones of mm -hmm. intelligence, how much creativity it uh, requires or what, what is the specification for, for it in terms of, I don't know, human values, uh, understanding, development of, uh, of the person? It's because as, as we speak, it's very, it's very important to develop the um, division intelligence system in the best and the most effective way for the humanity, which means that the creator of the system should also think about uh, i.e. alignment uh, in general, which also means that the person who creates it should also think uh, about something in a positive way, so should be, um, I would say, moral to some extent. So like the ethics of, of the programmer as, a, as an individual, does it exist at all? Or do you think it makes sure. sense about it? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think like programmers are like, uh, on priors uh, any uh, different from from rest of humanity when it comes to ethics and I'm sure uh, that... and whatnot. Uh, so uh, mm, just... there doesn't seem to be like uh, many many questions uh, in this. Uh, yeah, I do think that programming. I mean, I I'm, I'm a professional programmer myself, and uh, like whenever. Whenever, whenever, whenever I'm flying, I need to kind of like write down my occupation. Uh, like when entering entering a country, I just use programmer. It's just the easiest. Uh, and and I've been yeah. If I hadn't, if I wasn't in this call, I probably would be programming right now. Uh, so uh, yeah, I do think that there's like a lot of creativity in programming, especially sort of uh, the part that is concerned about system design. Uh, kind of think, think thinking about like what is the correct way uh, to cut the problem into pieces uh, that uh, that seems to be like uh, very resistant uh, to various kind of brute force uh, approaches uh, so so in that sense I do think that uh, programming at least some categories of programming are, are, can be highly creative at least you can you can find like highly Elegant and highly creative solutions uh, in in code, which is like a strong evidence that there is like a creativity is at play. Uh, can AIs uh, start programming better than humans? Sure, and uh, like there is already like significant progress. Uh, like when you see like some GPT free demos. Uh, I don't know how deep they are. Uh, are they just sort of like uh, regurgitating uh, some snippets, or is it like more fundamental? I don't actually know that. Uh, and like, yeah, like if we get like uh, strong skills in AI programming, uh, we should be worried really quickly uh, because uh, then we, at that point, we start building. Necessarily, we as civilization, we start building systems that we don't, we no longer understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's like I mean, you can always argue like how well we understand uh, the the things we are already, already building, uh, but it's uh, I think there's still some quality in some qualitative meaning we do because like there's always like a human in the loop. In, in, in critical uh, processes because of necessity, because right now there's like human competence needed. Uh, whereas like if you just completely remove human uh, from system design, initially from software and then ha then hardware, then like, yeah, you might kind of end up with just artifacts on this planet that nobody can explain, which is like very similar to what situation gorillas, rabbits and other species are. They just see a bunch of artifacts on this planet and they have no idea what they're about. So uh, I think it's uh, it's not a great position to be on being as a species. I can say that pigeons might have something like this on their mind, just like that can program and 
keep uh, yeah, advocating for, for, for the lives of pigeon. Um, I actually think um, on all this, I really like um, the uh, idea from the old interview of Daniel Dennett, so philosopher and cognitive scientist. Mm -hmm. Actually, learn it from you um, that uh, computers keep you honest in a way that philosophers have been hankering after for a long time. There is no place for impressionism in creating a computer model or an algorithm, which I think calls for being very precise and understanding what uh, you would like to do. Yeah, I do think that uh, sort of another implication there is that personally it helped me a lot in like my in my life, in my investing, in my philanthropy is that uh, programmers cannot develop very intuitive sense whether they understand something or not. And, and it's like if you're going to keep running into code that you think is, do, think is like should do X, and then you run it and it does Y, then, you, then it's like kind of like immediate uh, feedback that, no, you, you were wrong. You, you, you misunderstood the system. Just keep, keep looking. And like after you've done it like tens of thousands of times, uh, you, you, you can look at something and see like I uh, probably don't understand this like uh, uh, and which is uh, I think like a very nice capability to have as a person outside of programming context you can look at an argument to see like do I really understand this can I do understand it to the level where I can like write a program about it and I think Dana Dennett is, is kind of pointing to the similar thing it's like like uh, if you make an argument that the computer can understand then you can be certain that you have uh, produced something, an argument that is meaningful rather than something just that is a play of words. Yeah, so more about content than the form, I would say, to some extent. Um, speaking about all this, um, thinking how the systems are developed, I cannot help uh, ask you about uh, regulations of the sphere. So, mm -hmm. of course, if you if you're mindful about the risks, <clears throat> that something should be done about it. And probably not only researching the problem, but also trying to find uh, the best systems and mechanisms that could uh, lead to the situations where the risks are not even minimum, that risks are not existent, I would say, because the stakes are too high, but also trying to enhance the development of the systems and mechanisms still. So what what is the state of regulations of um, artificial intelligence at the moment in terms of understanding existential risks in general? Well, definitely, I'm very happy to say that there's like a lot of... Uh, increase in awareness and uh, interest uh, from uh, people like i mean a couple of weeks i have like a hearing in european parliament uh well, online one uh, uh like on on on, to on the topics of ai and uh now yeah that's the positive thing is like there's, there's like, a, like way more uh kind of understanding and perception that these are these are issues uh now, the bad news is that the uh, I'm not sure if I made this point already, but like uh, it's uh, kind of uh, very valuable to kind of divide the domain of AI into deployment of AI that already exists. Uh, so things like kind of uh, what are the so social risks uh, from uh, things like. Uh, uh, the proliferation of face recognition, for example, or, or self-driving cars, uh, or bias in machine learning. Uh, these are all, all problems that are about AIs that already exist. Uh, and I think like almost all the interest, almost all the efforts of, of uh, regulation and um, you know, technology ethicists, etc., cetera, uh, are dealing about this set of problems, problems from, from AIs that already exist. Uh, which is like good in a sense that like it's 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 great that there are people working on this and these are real problems. Don't get, don't get me wrong. However, there's uh, there's like uh, AI isn't um, isn't a uh, static target. It's, it's, it keeps moving. So it's uh, uh, we also have risk from AI that future risk from AI that don't exist yet. And uh, I think I would argue that these are actually the biggest uh, biggest risks that human humanity should be dealing with. Uh, and I think I don't think there's like enough uh, thinking uh, in regulatory circles about them. 
unfortunately, I don't have like very good recipes either. I can't say like, look, you should think about this, and specifically, you should kind of like uh, uh, try to figure out X, Y, Z regulation, how to address risks from from AI. That I mean, I have some some suggestions. I met a suggestion to go to uh, uh, people in Oxford called Governance of AI, uh, people who's kind of who are probably top experts in the world when it comes to thinking about long term as well as near term uh, near term issues. Uh, but like it's, it's it's a very novel area that uh, even though it's kind of growing rapidly, uh, I don't think we are in a we as society, we as civilization, are in the phase where we have like answers and can kind of put it to to the table of regulators. So yeah, I think there's like a growing interest in regulating and and figuring out how to maximize the downside or ma maximize the upside and uh, minimizing the downside from existing AI. Uh, and uh, and, th and this is great, but I think we are completely kind of uh, almost completely unguarded uh, against AI that uh, that uh, is going to be here next year or or the year after. Which I can only repeat is actually going to be developed very soon in like yeah. around thirty years or something. Um, I actually found really interesting um, the news that I will share with everyone in a moment. So. It's about um, OECD now trying to understand the uh, compute needs of national governments. And as far as I understand, this is exactly for, for the potential possibility to regulate um, development of artificial intelligence, trying to regulate the computational power. Is that correct? Huh. Interesting. I didn't know that. Oh. So yeah, like one thing that I've been saying to people is that uh, I do think that it's positive for, for regulators to start thinking about uh, what they should be doing in order to prepare for regulation when it comes to um, yeah concentration of computation computation power uh, because like there's like a very plausible hypothesis that computational power is the kind of remaining bastion that separates us from superhuman regime uh, therefore like uh, it would be great if you had the ability to say like okay stop like let's let's stop building those uh, those uh, data, those new data centers that are supposed to be like ten times more efficient than the ones we have, because look what happened with the last data center, right? So, so it's like if you don't have that ability, uh, then uh, then we might be in a very bad bad situation where we actually do need to stop the race of of uh, computing power. Well, at least I hope if OECD starts to work on this problem, usually it's actually. Um, yeah. Results in, in quite clear regulations. So. Yeah, I do, I do know some people in, at the OSCD, uh, and uh, I think they they're doing some good work there. Yeah. So let let us see. Maybe the regulations will be with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually want to open maybe for questions from participants. So if you have any questions, please raise your hands in the participants list uh, for for which you need to go to. Um, Name, I assume, and just raise the hands up. So let me see if we have, yes, we have a hand. Um, Victor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for having us here, dear Jan. Thank you for your noble efforts, particularly embodied in the Future of Life Institute activities. And I'm Viktor Halasuk representing the Ukrainian Association for the Club of Rome. And I see a great alignment here in the context of the sustainable development agenda. Mm -hmm. and, uh, taking a look at the existential risks uh, shortlist on your website, I'd like to suggest considering another type of uh, man-made risk. Technological development is not only creating uh, new opportunities for billions of people, but it also deepens the inequality gap and poor people will not have access to the technologies and will get even uh, poorer. And recently, Club of Rome member and the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz spoke on the rise of inequality at the Kyiv International Economic Forum. What's your take on that? Should we address a catastrophic inequality as an existential risk as well? I think it's kind of like uh, valuable to kind of draw a, a distinction. Like the like as a friend of mine says that like uh, the term existential risk has kind of uh, uh, outlived its is useful uh, usefulness. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, more like 
it would, might be valuable to start using the term extinction risk, uh, even though like extinction risk is like a more uh, comprehensive uh, concept, it includes things like kind of uh, uh, stable totalitarian global global totalitarianism, for example, that is stable over over like millions of years. Uh, basically, like it's extinction risk is defined as as a catastrophic reduction in uh, uh, humanity's potential. Uh, so, uh, so technically, from that perspective, I don't think the the welfare gap is an extinction risk. Even less so, it's an extinction risk. However, that is not to say that it's it's not important, of course. So it's it's uh, it's. Um, yeah, it's 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 the same thing with with like I mean, there are like tons of social uh, you know issues that uh, that needs to be addressed, and luckily there are like a lot of people also trying to kind of uh, improve things, which is uh, which is great. And like if you if you believe people like Steven Pinker, like we've been doing great. <laughs> like uh, I mean, you can argue with that, but but it's it's. Uh, uh, there is like definitely one kind of plausible argument that that the world has improved uh, over time. Uh, so uh, and thanks to like uh, yeah people like you people people who are kind of taking uh, taking the steps to to improve uh, the problems that that we, we are demonstrably having. Uh, so so yeah I, I kind of I, in summary I kind of acknowledge. Uh, that there are like a lot of uh, risks, or like a lo lot of risks. Uh, some of them are clearly catastrophic, uh, but not necessarily existential. Uh, for example, like I do think that the nuclear exchange, uh, like if there's like a detonation of all nuclear weapons on the planet, it's clearly going to be catastrophic. But I think it's unlikely to kill every person on the planet. Hence, by definition, it's not going to be it's not going to be uh, an extinction risk. Unless there's some like a weird runaway uh, scenario, uh, so yeah, I think that's like a wide palette of uh, meaningful, important topics to work on, uh, and I think people should kind of uh, pick the areas that they can make the biggest kind of contribution. Uh, and for example, one website that I suggest to people is uh, Eighty Thousand Hours, which is uh, kind of career counseling. Uh, organization uh, for people who are kind of at the start of their career, which is like, like sort of average, on average measured in, in 80,000 80, hours of work uh, as, as one person is going to contribute. And like, it's a very important decision that people are going to make, like, where should my 80,000 hours go? And, it, and they specifically say that, like, it doesn't mean that everybody should work on AI risk. No, it, it, it's important to, to think about, like, what is a competitive advantage? What is what is the kind of uh, yeah? What are the tractability, importance, and uh, neglectedness of, of of the topics uh, that you could be working, and then choose based on your or on on your own on your own position. Which probably leads to also the questions that uh, um, I just wanted to add to this. So. Is it possible to use uh, some artificial intelligence systems in order to solve mm -hmm. problems such as inequality? So just to oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So like in, in more generally, I do think that uh, like one big thing that kind of attracts me to uh, to AI risk in particular is that uh, there's like a lot of upside, and this upside is also measured in addressing many other risks. So for example, if we get Kind of our act together and completely solve the risk from AI, we might have our kind of we suddenly have like a comp competence that uh, humanity never has had. We ha might have super intelligent competence to solve the other problems, uh, including like bio risk, which is like next second on my list, uh, including like many other problems. Generally, kind of like pushing the future towards a much better tra trajectory, measured in a uh, lot of. Uh, and there's like still like philosophical debates about how should we measure the goodness of the uh, of the future, uh, but it's 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 obvious that uh, things like inequality does have like is an important factor in this uh, like quality of the future that we should be improving. So another reason to try to do the uh, beneficial artificial intelligence systems. Yeah, I agree. Okay. 
So we have the next, the next question from Marina, please. Uh, Olena Jan, thank you so much for this um, thought-provoking discussion. And actually, my question is in line with, uh, with the topic you just started uh, talking about this inequality. Uh, Jan, my question is a bit maybe provocative or philosophical to you. So I'll be speaking as a political scientist and a social science scholar. And um, my topic uh, is, so maybe for many of uh, attendees today, it will sound already common, but it's still rel relatively new. And these are the universal human rights, tolerance, diversity, and human rights promotion across the world. And I've been thinking about the whole discussion of uh, ethics in AI and about, uh, as you said, like, you know, fighting inequality, bringing greater good to people. I've been wondering, uh, can we though, so on one hand, can we teach AI values? So uh, is this something, I mean, I understand that AI doesn't perceive things as human brain does. So it doesn't see, uh, you know, human beings of flesh and blood. Uh, but just you know, numbers and algorithms. Uh, but still, can we, you know, can we bring the values to AI? And the second question is: still, I feel, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the discussion around AI is pretty much Western or you know, uh, Europeanized, Westernized, Americanized. Uh, though the developments in AI technology is definitely going across the world. But if we, we speak about the ethics, values, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all this we still measure this somehow in, uh, I think, what we call universal human rights, universal you know, human rights norms, those are not that universal. So what, what is your take on this? What do you think, you know, how, how can we uh, cope with this? How can we deal with this? Yeah, it's a huge topic. Uh, I don't know where to start. Mm. I, mean, I mean, first of all, yeah, uh, teaching AI uh, values is... Uh, Definitely seems possible. Uh, like, uh, like that's like in essence what AI alignment means. Like uh, aligning what AI would consider a good future, or a group of AIs would consider a good future, and and what humans would or should consider a good future. Because like our understanding of what good future is keeps developing. Uh, so uh, so yeah, and that's like that's like if you go to alignmentforum.org, a lot of the discussion there is about how do you how do you do what's called like value loading, uh, solving the value loading problem, uh, having like uh, assuming increasing your competent systems, and then how you engineer the trajectory in a way that that with each increasing competence, they would also have like a better understanding and better motivation to follow the values um, that that we want them to follow, that or that we should want them to to follow. It's kind of really, really non. Uh, Indirect in some sense. Uh, it's also it's actually the term for it is called indirect normativity. So instead of like telling AI what to do, you you basically uh, create an AI that is interested in, in finding out what it should do uh, according to uh, according to our values or our things that our values imply. Uh, so yeah, and there's a lot of interesting work happening in that area. So, uh, so when it comes to kind of like uh, Eastern, Western, I mean, I, I keep kind of like stressing that, look, I'm literally between East and the West, as, as are you, right? So it's, uh, uh, I kind of totally want to kind of maximize the fact that I'm, that like the flight to Beijing <laughs> from, from this place is, is uh, uh, actually a little bit shorter, but in the, uh, roughly the same time to Washington. Uh, so uh, so I, uh, this is totally a global issue and it's, um, uh, it should be, you know, we should have like different you know, stakeholders in the world having having a voice uh, in, in the matter. Like one important consider consideration that, that people are going to forget is that the Western uh, academic thinking is usually international. Uh, so it's like... Uh, that there's like a very strong asymmetry between the kind of the leading universities in the West and leading universities uh, in the in the East because language barrier. There are like a lot of Chinese, Japanese, Asian, uh, and whatnot uh, scientists in, in the top team in, in, in the top universities. So in that sense, uh, they aren't kind of strictly Western teams that are working on this. They're, they're international teams that just happen to be located uh, around the uh, kind of intellectual centers in the in the West, for what it's worth. 
Uh, but yeah, I agree that it's, it's it's kind of really important to make sure that every every part of the planet is is uh, has a voice in this. Well, I feel that maybe we will do the subcommittee in our group uh, on on the values for artificial intelligence or something. This you see, this is very appealing subject for for everyone. I think. <laughs> Okay, so the next the next um, question I'm on duty and please um, get us off. Thank you, and I'm grateful to the invitation to take part in the group discussion. And Jan, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and your ideas. Uh, maybe I'll try to make some bridge from the start of your uh, speech up to now, uh, fear. Uh, fear is essential part of every human being, of humankind. It's a part of natural selection. And as you told, uh, nuclear weapon, atomic energy, that was enough for human beings to understand the risks, the existential risks or cat catastrophic risks inputted into that framework. So that was enough to, during the Cold War, to establish some clear and transparent rules, establish institutions, I mean like International Agency of Atomic Energy and so on. Uh, what, what is happening now? Uh, we are having some developed technologies, ruling energy, including nuclear weapon, nuclear plants, nuclear weapons, station, transportation, health issues, uh, data-driven technologies rule the economic and social systems. But in my mind, very few people recognize that uh, the risks are underestimated. Uh, and that's my question, whether you could comment uh, why they are underestimated and is uh, that happening intentionally or unintentionally? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's mostly unintentionally. The, um, sort of one, I think, useful framework uh, to look at uh, AI risk, especially kind of like contemporary one, uh, is to kind of treat it as an externality. Um, so uh, it's like uh, there's like in the seventies, uh, we that is in the West at least uh, had. Um, uh, and what startup environmental movement where uh, you know people exceedingly realized that uh, uh, companies are having really bad externalities on the on the nature uh, in the environment so like that there, there needs to be some kind of uh, correction uh, that uh, causes them to take into account because the market was not uh, as economists know market has externalities things that the market does not ensure uh, are kind of priced in, in into the into the products and services that companies provide and I, I would argue that the risks from AI or more general risks from advanced technologies uh, a large part of them are externalities like that companies are incentivized to come up with uh, you know, basically like scientists and companies and it's kind of considered like a wider group are incentivized to come up with more and more Competent systems. Again, if you think about like AI as a delegation of human decisions to increasing the competent machines, uh, and but they are not really incentivized uh, monetarily to think about uh, what might be the side effects of of them uh, working on on working on this increased competence, increasing competent systems, uh, be they in, in like increased inequality as was mentioned earlier or complete kind of uh, extermination of human species as a result of uh, massive uh, environmental disruption, for example. Uh, so yeah, I, I do think like, that's, that's a kind of productive way of thinking about it. It's also hopeful because like, clearly the companies are way more environmentally conscious now than they were in, in like 50s, 60s, 70s. So, so it's, uh, uh, I think it might be kind of actually productive uh, discussion to be had, uh, thinking about, yep, you're, you are sort of like economically incentivized uh, to do this, even like in some countries in the US, there's like a laws that you're supposed to maximize the shareholder value. If you don't create this AI that is supposed to maximize your profits, uh, you might be sued uh, in a class action lawsuit. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so it's like perhaps 
that's like one thing where regulators can kind of step in and go like, like look, there might be bad externalities. We need to think about how to kind of price them in, just like we are thinking about how to price in the externalities from uh, kind of carbon emissions, uh, et cetera. Which calls again also for regulation, of course, which would uh, make it all possible to work with. Okay. Yeah, although like I, I want to stress that like it's not it's not a silver bullet. Regulation is like a very broad and blunt tool that uh, that we should be kind of careful careful with. It, it has its own externalities. Let's put it that way. Okay, so Yaroslav Sherbak, please. Okay, so he disconnected. Okay, so no, uh, no, he's here, but like uh, he, uh, we can't hear you. And I can't. Do you hear me now? Yep, we can. Oh, sorry. So uh, my question is connected with AI capacity. Uh, I would like to ask if it is uh, uh, so. There is there any branch where AI uh, cannot be better than human? I really don't think so. It's like uh, it, it's uh, uh, it kind of comes down to um, to how the laws of physics work, uh, and like uh, we have like a pretty we as civilization have like really pretty good idea how about the laws of physics uh, work. Uh, on kind of microscopic level, uh, that uh, is kind of relevant uh, for the brain. So uh, it would be like a massive surprise uh, if there were something that human brain would be fundamentally able to do that uh, other kind of human created uh, configurations of atoms uh, wouldn't be able to, to do. Uh, and this massive surprise would be to the physicists, uh, because then it implies that that there is something that's like a something we have massively understood about the laws of physics, which is like, it's very safe bet to, to bet against. If somebody says that we have fundamentally misunderstood the laws of physics, it's like, just bet against them. Just make them bet immediately. Yeah, stuff is actually a part of uh, the chess playing group who suffered from the development mm -hmm. of all the chess software equipment. So uh, I think it's a bit rewarding to understand that not only chess community suffered from this, but actually everyone will suffer from this because... This Did you actually suffer, by the way? I'm, I'm actually genuinely curious. Like, in some ways that, like, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't actually, know, like, I mean, I, I know how to play chess, but I've never been kind of, like, part of a community. So it's like, kind of... Uh, I have heard uh, uh, that that people are kind of excited to play against these kind of uh, god <laughs> god players, uh, but uh, and, and kind of especially in Go community that they're excited to kind of discover things that human civilization did miss. So again, they're kind of playing against a new civilization now and having having matches against aliens. Uh, so at least temporarily, it, it, it must be exciting. Yes, I do want to share your experiences playing with computer programs. Maybe even Alpha Zero. Yeah, uh, I have I have played some games uh, with it, and I think now it's totally impossible to play with them. So you're just outplaying the best uh, players in the world, and even it is not um, uh, only in chess. Also in uh, some uh, hmm. esports esports games, mm -hmm. AI uh, is also developing, and uh, uh, a human now. Cannot even compete with them. But but is it like even if you know that you're not going to win, is it interesting to play to learn things uh, from AI while you're playing or not? Mm, I think mostly it uh, helps you to analyze your games to oh, better okay. understand your mistakes when you're playing with uh, another person. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. So I can share also my own experience because. Um, uh, yeah, chess uh, is very much influenced by computers, but we also had even kind of like movement how to use computers even for, for playing. Of course, chess players use computers a lot for uh, for preparations and as yet even like, uh, because you can also set in the programs to um, how competent you want your opponent to be. So you, you, you can play not with the highest possible yeah, yeah. level of the program, but you can limit it. And um, for example, there is also uh, a, 
chess, which is called advanced chess, uh, and this is very, very yeah. you can play with the help of computers. So you usually limit the time for, for 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 making moves, for example. And I did play such a match. It uh, it didn't become a hugely popular art of chess, but I would say it was a very interesting experience trying to use. Um, the computer program to help you, and I played against uh, at the time world champion Anna Shenina, and of course I, I'm not that professional chess player as she is, and I could draw the game, which means that uh, mm. it gave me quite a lot of possibilities to advance uh, with the help of of technology. I think like one really interesting question is like is advanced chess more capable uh, than computer chess? Uh, so advanced like. Uh, and uh, I like Gary Kasparov, who is like a bit of a family friend of mine. Like he, he's kind of like has made like a big argument out of this. Like, look, human AI cooperation is going to be stronger than AI, and I think he's wrong about this. I think I, I, I right now I would bet that advanced chess, like person playing against a computer with the help of a computer, is going to lose the computer. Uh, but I don't know what the current current exact status status is there. We can research it further. I think it's yeah, very. Yeah. So it's a very interesting question because it kind of sheds light into into exactly this question that Jaroslav stuff asked. Like, are there sort of like if, even if there aren't domains that that in principle humans can't can't uh, kind of do better than AI, but are there domains that that we are we are kind of like feel should should feel like relatively safe uh, for for like uh, several decades still? We will definitely research this. So. <laughs> And I ask uh, Maxim to join us. Oh, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Jan. Hello, everybody. Uh, when listening to this discussion, because you mentioned Steven Pinker, and I have this um, question, especially inspired by the questions of other colleagues, so Marina, who asked about teaching, I, I uh, value AI value. Senyarasla spoke about fear of driving force. When Steven Pinker and uh, you, Yuval Noah Harari met in Kiev a couple of years ago. I had the pleasure of moderating the discussion. Hmm. It was offline in a hotel room, and it also it is available on YouTube. So even before the discussion and during the discussion, it was like you know bipolar discussion. One of them, Stephen Pinker, said Every, everything is going to be good. We're going to survive. We got through this. Uh, Harari, on the other hand, did this hysteria. We're all going to die. Something <laughs> happened. Ah, ah, we're all going to die. And now, even if we discuss the I. AI development is, um, is something like suffering from it. I always give my students this example. Remember when we got to dialing the numbers and not asking the lady to put us in connection to somebody. Mm -hmm. So many women actually suffered because they lost their jobs. We can cry many hours, but a lot of people suffered, okay? But mm -hmm. we all now live in a much more comfortable conditions. So my question is maybe to all of us and young, of course to you, how can we shape the discourse and discussion about our future related to technological developments, to different fears, without speaking only black and white. Because journalists yeah, yeah. and all the you know, lower level discussion is always about two bipolar things. We're all gonna mm -hmm. die, everything is going to be wonderful. So what mm -hmm. is our responsibility? And if there are any ways of shaping the discussion without falling into extremes, like Pinker and Harari do in their discussion. <laughs> yeah, I met also, with Pinker and Harari, and uh, like I don't remember Harari being like super doom guy, but definitely Pinker is like just like uh, super roast color glass. I think he's kind of made his brand as being like the the, the guy who has the highest concentration of roast color <laughs> in, in his glasses. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I, I definitely agree with you about his uh, points. Like I think he's kind of painted himself into a corner saying that everything is going to be all right. So like if people people point out to him like, look, there's like obvious risk here. He's like, ah, ah, well, people will be working on it. So like, don't worry about it. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's uh, I don't think it's uh, his positions in when it comes to just painting like uh, everything will be good. Uh, like he's like super defensive. It's like, easy to defend uh, his positions there. Although like I think he's, he has, like, makes some, does make a lot of good points about uh, history in general, uh, pointing like things improving in human civilization uh, over time. The, like that doesn't mean that like you should be careful assuming that the trend will continue. Is basically my point. I think like one general uh, argument they have against uh, you know 
seeing the world in black or white is that it's just completely counterproductive. Uh, like, uh, like you can kind of divide the world into, into like roughly like free, free a future. You can divide the future into three categories. One category, everything is going to hell regardless of what we do. <laughs> and then like the, 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 the other extreme is like, everything is going to be just fine regardless of what we do. <laughs> And in the middle is like the world is going to, like the future is going to depend on what we do. And my argument is that we can safely ignore the extremes because by definition, nothing like anything we do is not going to influence <laughs> the outcome in those, those scenarios. That is going to be just fine or like it's going to be like we're all going to die. So like it's, it's just like safe to ignore those and, and think about the world where we can make a difference and, and focus, focus. It's just like a rational thing to do. So that's what I'm trying to do. So like when somebody, some people ask me like, like I kind of, sound very gloomy, uh, like, are you optimist still? I'm saying like, yes, I'm optimist for pragmatic reason. <laughs> so it's like, I believe that like, we can do things that, that uh, will fix the future. Which sounds as a total optimist for me, actually, so. <laughs> total, okay. Um, I see the hands and the questions, but I can't really resist uh, using this uh, opportunity and questions that uh, Max said. Uh, uh, to ask you about the perception of uh, artificial intelligence by... It's an awesome paper. In, ...in general. So, yeah, this is, I'm sharing also for people to know about it, and this is the paper that you usually advertise uh, for everyone to read, uh, which is quite recent. It describes um, on 131 pages uh, anything you want to know about this um, uh, subject, especially the ways of different systems and also how to regulate or like how to make objectives, how to use it. But this is the way how it looks. So it's, it's a totally research paper. So, you know, like uh, it has pictures, but um, not, not really much of them. So this is what I would say the research community of artificial intelligence usually see when they work on the subject. So this is what usually the society see on the subject, uh, which is a screenshot of a popular newspaper in uh, Ukraine, so everyone can read except for you, Jan. So it says that artificial intelligence warned people that it can hurt them. And it has a really interesting picture of a lady who probably talked herself that uh, uh, she is going to hurt uh, everyone in Ukraine specifically because it's, uh, it's our newspaper. And uh, even this is the example from the Future of Life Institute website where I'm sure you carefully prepared all the text to be, I would say, in the middle of this very strong research papers and that, uh, you know, like, main uh, general uh, like description of AI, but of Life Institute, what you have in terms of pictures, how to describe this, is still this, uh, I would still still lady, and she's quite angry probably, and she has a haircut from the programming code and everything, so so it's still, you know, like doesn't really describe uh, all the videos to, to, to address the people. And like, there's, there's like uh, Stuart Russell, uh, like the leading voice of uh, AI safety in academia, and the author of the leading AI textbook, uh, he has this saying that he can put out a blank paper to the press and press will put a picture of Terminator uh, next to it. Like he's very frustrated about this, like uh, uh, really incorrect pictures uh, shown when it comes to AI. Now, a journalist once asked me, like acknowledge this thing and asked me like, so Jan, what do you think, what kind of pictures should be, be showing? And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you have a point. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so like there, there is like really problem that the problem is that that the issues are very abstract. So it's got, they're like super hard to illustrate in a way that kind of human minds would find interesting. I agree. That's why, you know, like I'm also bringing to the attention like everything you can find, for example, when you yeah. find the artificial intelligence risk, which is again, a full of uh, bold, uh, mostly female robots, uh, you know, like everything. Somehow, President of EU. <laughs> in this blue, uh, bluish shades uh, and everything. So actually, it's quite the patterns already, and uh, it made me really think, you know, like how to solve this problem because visualization is hugely important. You know, like if we have this yeah. now subject only in this way, it can bring the problem. So if you have 
time I will probably share how I was thinking. I think, yeah, I think like the the framing of delegation of decisions uh, is something that is like really crucial uh, or like really core at the at the, at the problem. And like now the question, how do you illustrate the delegation of decisions <laughs> as an abstract concept? You can have abstract thinking about it. At least we saw from the yeah, but in p images, like like the, the problem with images is that that that. Oh, yeah. I have seen this is quite tricky for computers still to do art, so it's still the human uh, ability to think of very good concepts that could uh, illustrate yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, I'm glad you acknowledge the problem, so you are not thinking that they... Sure, sure. But it's, it's a hard problem, so it's like, like if, if you could uh, figure out like better visuals, that would be helpful, because most of the human brain is about visuals. <laughs> Still intercepted, as I usually say, is yours. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so there's a question in, in chat, like I uh, will just quickly answer it. Like mm -hmm. some experts think that AI would be focus of geopolitical competition. What do you think about the moratorium for AI research as a mechanism to reduce the threat of AI arms race? Like, like yeah, I, sort of my initial kind of reaction is that it's not it doesn't sound realistic uh, right now uh, to kind of have like a moratorium or something that like people are making money out of right now. <laughs> like that's a one really big uh, difference between this AI summer and previous AI summers is now AI is profitable. So like you would be kind of uh, having a moratorium on, on pro potentially profitable, potentially very profitable things, uh, which is hard. You need like very, very good justification for that. And also, like, I'm not sure that's actually would help. That said, like, if there are ideas how to do it in a careful manner, in a manner that's kind of like guaranteed, or like current, not guaranteed, but like very plausibly uh, positive, or at least if there's a way, again, as I said about the regulation of computational power concentration, is there's ability to kind of increase the preparedness for such a moratorium. I think it might be a good good thing to think along those lines. Makes sense. Okay, so the next question will come from Mari, please join us. We can't hear you, Mari. Yeah, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Hi, and greetings from Tallinn. I'm probably the only other Estonian on this call. Okay. Yeah, sure, I don't want to ask Estonians. Yeah, I also work at Illuminate together with Olena, and, and thank you both for the very interesting mm. discussion. And my question is actually related to Jana's question, but uh, also about this military use of AI, that is there already a kind of race going on between governments uh, in some way, and, and what are the, which are the governments to pay more attention to in this regard? It definitely seems to be going on something i'm not like very familiar with the military side of things um like luckily sort of the good news is that it seems to be that uh, at least in many situations ai isn't just robust enough uh for like a wide scale deployment uh now the bad news is that it's probably going to get robust and uh and direct this has me like pretty concerned and the reasons why it's why I'm very concerned about military AI is kind of non-obvious. Like one reason why I'm concerned about military AI is that it kind of democratizes the warfare. And if you look at what's happening in cyber warfare right now, most attacks are not most of the attacks are performed by non-state actors and actors who we might even know who they were. So in some ways like uh, having systems that no longer need humans to attack things kind of open it up to have like military attacks sold on the black market just like the cyber attacks are, are sold uh, on black market right now which is like basically a world where nobody can feel safe outside uh, so so that's i don't i don't think it's a great uh, prospect uh, so it should be in the interest of like military existing military powers to prevent uh, such democratization of AI. I'm not sure if they have like thought about it enough. Perhaps they have. I don't know. And the second reason why I think it's very dangerous to have military arms races is that it kind of arms races, in game theoretical sense, constrain ability of uh, 
participants to cooperate in areas that matters. So like if it turns out like we are in a situation where like an alien spaceship is coming, uh, if you are kind of using this alien technology already to compete against each other, it makes like way harder to, to ensure that the humanity's response to this alien intervention is going to be end, end well for humans, hu humanity. So in that sense, it would be really difficult uh, to handle like the civilization and threat in a situation where people are gonna, or the powers are deep down in, in competing it, it against each other, each other in military domain with AI. Yeah, quite important topic think about yeah and i'm just mindful of your time is it fine if we continue so yeah um, perhaps like five minutes then i need to go break i have another another call coming <laughs> at, at the so shop over i give uh, the floor to the parties um hi everyone um elena thank you for invitation um, yeah, and I'm, maybe I will continue uh, this topic of uh, like geopolitics um, because we all see what uh, China competing uh, against uh, United States against Western world in AI, and uh, the, and com actually uh, countries inside uh, like countries um, in the Western world competing uh, with each other in the AI, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, what do you think about regulation? Because uh, from my point of view, like regulation in the uh, Western world slowed down uh, AI uh, development. Uh, when uh, in China, uh, they have much better re regulation in AI. So China, have, uh, China has kind of competitive advantages in this field. And uh, resulting uh, could be what China just win uh, in this competition, uh, which is kind of not good for the rest of the world. So what do you think about this? Thank you. I think it's like a very complex uh, topic. I definitely do not think that uh, uh, China has like a massive advantage um, when it comes to AI. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, it's like a civilizational problem. Like uh, its advantage only can be kind of short. Uh, short-lived um, if like human extinction is a side effect of your of your advantage then like you're not going to get to enjoy your advantage for very, very long uh, the, and i do think that there's like an interesting i mean i've been to china I've, like several times uh, recently and well before the pandemic and i do think that there seems to be like a more acknowledgement of the potential downsides uh, there uh, than in the west uh, for for multiple reasons, uh, one is that they just seem to be thinking in longer term than than Western politicians, uh, and uh, are kind of like prioritize more. Uh, they call it harmony. <laughs> you can call it control. Uh, so so it, it's kind of very real danger uh, for them of losing losing uh, control to technology, like some kind of like uncontrolled. Uh, so in, in that sense, I, in some ways, Chinese are more trustworthy when it comes to regulating AI. Uh, that's kind of the good news. Uh, like, sure, there are arguments about like them being kind of more relaxed about uh, uh, data protection, etc., that gives them advantage. Yeah, I don't think there are like really big advantages in the, in the, in a kind of big picture. Uh, I do think that West does have like massive advantage uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier, which is like the asymmetry of the talent flow. Uh, like a lot of the top uh, leading AI teams have Chinese uh, in the West uh, on board uh, because it's just way easier to go that way than, than the other way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the jury is still very out there, like which way it goes. And also, I'm not actually sure from humanities, a species perspective, that it's necessarily a bad thing if, if uh, China gets to uh, super competent AI first. In some ways, it would be. Uh, more controllable and contained situation. I should say that Vitaly was uh, too humble not to mention that he's actually leading the uh, IE committee at our Ministry of Digitalization in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of discussions with Vitaly about uh, the necessity of regulations or norms. Uh, and I hope this meeting just brought a bit of light that it needs to be regulated to some extent. Yeah, also I think that it's like it's valuable they're going to keep, they're going to also think about this, like uh, what are the you know, 
regulate what what are the ideas to regulate the existing AI versus think about like what's going to happen uh, once we have like uh, AI that we don't have yet and and problems that that are, might be qualitatively new and from like extremely kind of some like I think in some interview somebody asked me about this and, and I said that like ultimately from like really humanity's perspective if you think about like AI as as an as an alien spaceship that's going to land here like. The most important thing about the uh, Chinese Communist Party, as well as uh, Catholic Church or, and uh, uh, the US government is that they're the most powerful human organizations. And you definitely want, when it comes to like dealing with aliens, you definitely want them to cooperate and rather than kind of like uh, have some kind of uh, pissing match against each other. Thank you so much for this example of uh, alienship. I will use it in conversations with our Ministry of Digitalization. <laughs> if you help us. Unfortunately, mindful of your time, we just uh, I, I, I'm not taking more questions. And uh, just thank you so much for, for all your time. I hope you will stay connected with our group because we have uh, big plans and we are just starting to understand all of these questions. Uh, have you been to Ukraine, actually? I have not actually. <laughs> my my sister has been there many times, and I have one of my best friends. He's like half Ukrainian, who goes back and forth uh, uh, a lot. So invitation for you to visit Ukraine, whatever, whenever it will be possible to travel.